chemistry, killing using uh, radio labels, right? We've heard in this uh, meeting a couple of times that one challenge is the heterogeneity of tumor cells, and typically the target is not expressed in all the cells, but only in a minority. So could it be that using uh, radio-labeled antibodies, that, that takes care of heterogeneity? Is that an advantage that people yeah, think of? Yeah, I don't, you know, whichever works. <clears throat> peptides, small molecules, antibodies, but so far, the peptides, small peptides and small molecules have been better than antibodies. Now, part of that is the imaging side. You know, we want to go there quickly, bind quickly, clear away, and increase the signal to noise for the imaging. But we also want that in therapy. Yeah. Now, you know, when people look at pharmacokinetics and dynamics in drugs, they're looking in blood. With the imaging, we look at it in the tissue. So we know the real pharmacokinetics and dynamics. You know, with patients, we don't know that a drug hit a target. We don't know that it occupied 50 to 80 percent mm -hmm. to induce the pharmacologic response. So a lot of the power is, the, is in the imaging that we can watch and measure. And that allows us to optimize the criteria and do that in patients before we ever go into our trials and before we even go to the therapeutic. Now, antibodies, I don't know. Nobody's really optimized them. Some people have tried to do them. Yeah. Johnson Johnson actually <clears throat> focuses on diagnostics with antibodies. But so far, they haven't beat our little company. Okay, thank you. Any questions? Yeah, Wei? I should go. Oh, um, maybe we can take that question, meanwhile, can work back. Oh, there. okay. Um, Thank you. I, I'm a veterinarian, and I've attended these conferences for several years, and I've always learned a lot. I was the former president and CEO of an animal foundation that gave grants out about 200 to 300 a year to advance animal health. So my question is, how are you connected to that world? Um, a couple years ago, I attended an IOM meeting looking at, you know, with a dog, a pet dog's life expectancy, maybe 10 years, how you might be able to utilize that information for more rapid development. And then I guess my last part is um, I'm part, or at least I'm helping with the animal welfare aspect of a 10,000 dog longitudinal study at the University of Washington here, the Dog Aging Project. So just hoping that, you know, when we think of evolutionary biology, you say the mouse model doesn't work, companion animals might be good, and that they're exposed to the same environmental toxins that we are. So while you like to control for variables, it might be the variables also that you need to address. So just wondering, how do you connect all these worlds together to maybe help advance health for humans and animals? Well, it's called, <clears throat> it's called a PET scan, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, we've actually for years tried their mobile pet services and tried to get them to go around to the vet clinics. But, you know, they're in their, what, 50 million dogs and cats in America? They're not all the bureaucracy to deliver care to them. And people care about their pets. But we've so far not convinced anyone to build a business out of it. We'd like to. You know, the things we do in patients came from animals, right? They helped us get there. So we should come back to them, but it has to be a bus business. Any other answer, David? You want to try? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think I can answer more from my former life in, um, in pharmaceutical industry and oncology. You know, it, the, the, the idea of doing um, clinical trials in dogs at some of the major veterinary centers um, certainly was, um, you know, we discussed that a lot, and um, 
uh, you know, the, the, there are still, I think, a lot of barriers to doing that in terms, uh, especially when you're trying to run a development program quickly, and the industry is not used to putting that kind of an experiment on critical path. The one play where, place where I saw it get some play was in sarcoma, because dogs get a lot of sarcoma. And um, for the groups working in that area, particularly with intratumoral agents, and agents where you know that you're going to have um, on-target effects in dogs with your agent. So, you know, it's not appropriate for every monoclonal antibody. Um, but but there, were certain, there were certain use cases, but relatively limited ones that I saw where people were going into dogs, and particularly, as I said, in sarcoma, showing some initial proof of concept for, say, intratumoral agents that then led to more interest from the pharma industry, from the biotechs that were doing that. Um, that's actually where I've seen this happen, is with a smaller biotech that may be, you know, it may be pushing it to fund the initial clinical trial. They may be doing this in order to generate more interest. Um, so I, you know, if I was going to drum up interest in doing more of this, I'd probably be going around to some of the more, you know, smaller biotechs that might want a quick proof of concept. Any other opinions? Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, maybe you could move to the next question, Wei. Uh, yeah, the, I, I, I was just really fascinated by the whole body pet scan. And, um, and actually, the CEO of Wake Forest, uh, uh, the Baptist Health, Julie Freshlight, actually from UC Davis, and she was involved in, in, in that uh, whole program. And, and uh, so we've been pretty excited about it. And, and, and so the, the, there, there are, I guess, a couple of questions. The first question is, um, if you envision uh, to use the whole body as the uh, routine screening, and uh, the I, I guess you have to deal with the dose issue, right? You know, for for like for lung cancer, you have to use a low dose uh, PET scan for uh, to screen a potential lung cancer, and 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 then there's always a controversy about uh, the uh, that approach, and how many false positive you have, and. And you can you can see a nodule, but it's not really cancer. So so I envision you're probably going to encounter the same problem for the whole body, you know, scan and, and how much a false positive you know can you see and and, and what I guess what's a, what's the extent of benefit and and of detecting something and uh, and and what's the chance uh, what's the uh, I guess how how much uh, um, would you encounter uh, something which it you know, may look alarming, but you know, make people worry the nervous, but end up you know not really cancer or or, or disease. So, so <clears throat> um, one way to answer that question very simply, yeah. is I don't know the answer. <laughs> but like the Chinese company yeah. did, they said we'll build it and find out. And um, so they have come into America. <clears throat> They've gotten all their products FDA approved this last year, including the Explorer. Most likely it will go into research centers to establish the science that will evolve into the clinical practice if that's appropriate. Now, can it do better studies in clinical care? Absolutely. <laughs> do them quicker. The resolution in contrast is so high, it's hard to even display the images, you know? So, but I think it has to be built on a scientific foundation of the new principles unique to that technology first. But so it's so going to need the clinical trials, or they're planning to set up clinical trials, you know, for like screening purposes, and and and, and I guess you need a lot of imaging uh, algorithm, imaging approach to analyze the data, or even to store the data. I think the data is going to be huge. Well, that, yeah. you know, that's moved very quickly in terms of the system works, yeah. you know, the first images, but all the analysis software is being done. If you bill for a PET CT with that system, you get paid. So there, there are ways to move in, but you have to be bold and you should be more creative about it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is a new world of watching the biochemistry and biology and pharmacology throughout the entire body. Why not take yep. advantage of that? Yep. Yeah, I agree <clears throat> completely. We would love to have a system you know, in our hospital. So our, yeah. our radiologists are actually very excited about this model. They're discussing with the company to trying to 
bring the system to, to our hospital. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. So at UC Davis, there is a smaller version of that in the, uh, in the monkey colony already. Thank you. Maybe. No, absolutely. <clears throat> but pharmacokinetics and dynamics at the target in the tissue, not the blood, you know. I mean, the real. You know, we don't, the issue about the antibody, you know, the antibodies stay too long. Now, with drugs, you want that. But because we can measure the dose to the target, we can optimize the radiation therapy. And that's what we optimize, not long time. We optimize the ratio of, of, the, of the probe and the target at the cell and internalize. We measure it. So we don't go by those criteria of longer is better. That's exposure to us. You know. So yes, <clears throat> most, you know, there are 2,000 pet probes. Where did they come from? They came from biochemistry and the pharmaceutical industry. <laughs> yeah. Seven of the properties to optimize a drug, five of those are equivalent for a pet probe. The only two that are not <clears throat> is the drug you want to stay there a long time, keep banging on the target, and you want a high concentration surround the target. We don't want that, <laughs> obviously. But the other criteria are the same. High affinity, specificity, good pharmacodynamics and kinetics, and safe, you know? So we like those things. So there are many drugs that are already labeled with that. But the pharmaceutical industry keeps doing things the way they've always done them, you know? So when we were talking, <clears throat> Lee Hood and I tried to change the the SBIRs, and we had to put a committee together, some academics and some people in pharma. Uh, I think the pharma guy was from, from Merck. <clears throat> so I told him in the break, we developed a way at UCLA to get an IND put together, submitted, approved for $50,000, as opposed to pet probes are half a million to a million. So I said, what is the cost in your company to get an IND for a drug. And he said, you know, when I hit the button to just start, that's 30 million. I said, but you, can't you cut the cost? And he said, Michael, if I cut the cost, they'll just cut my budget. That's their culture, you know, it's, but not our culture. You know, like going through, you know, you can't afford to be foolish. So you have to be creative. Thank you. Is there any questions from the back row? Yeah. Uh, it seems like a key um, aspect for all of these approaches is to be able to identify the disease-specific targets. Can you guys talk a little bit about how you go about identifying them and then the, the probe that uh, will identify the target for diagnostics or therapeutics? <clears throat> so I think that a lot of the research to date uh, in identification of targets has really started with model systems. So looking at cell lines, looking at animals, uh, I think that given the tools that exist today, we can change that paradigm and actually start with the patients. Uh, and so by looking as broadly as possible um, at a patient's tumor, I it creates the opportunity to identify a whole host of new therapeutic targets. Uh, and you know, if you have a, a good way of identifying it, then you can probably tag it with a radioactive warhead and then cure it. Uh, so I think that what we're probably beginning to see is 
uh, an evolution of truly personalized medicine, not necessarily just identifying the nature of the cancer, uh, but moving it to uh, personalized therapeutics where uh, each therapy can be relatively easily made for that particular patient. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll second that. You know, obviously, you know, the era of population genetics got us all started in terms of finding targets, looking at population level features, but I think what we're, what's maturing is the ability to look at the individual level using systems tools and to find targets, again, from humans um, that way. Um, I think that there are many, many disease states that are characterized by heterogeneity, where heterogeneity is the substrate for the di what happens dynamically when you put selective pressure on diseases, whether it's cancer, whether it's an infectious disease. And um, the ability to, um, I, mean, I think what we're getting better at is defining the experimental contexts where we should be go looking, go looking with these tools. If we have a disease state, if we have things that we know can be an intervention that perturbs that state, and if we can sample at multiple time points to look for dynamics, and we're looking at how heterogeneity influences evolution, we're able to get a much more detailed picture of that disease state than we were able to do before, and a much more dynamic picture. I think that uh, you know, this is one big future avenue for target discovery and simultaneous biomarker discovery. Um, very broadly, I think that as those tools mature, and there are very, very critical informatic tools that have to go along with the technical tools, um, that that's gonna be a source of a lot of um, revolution in target discovery and validation. Thank you. Any more questions? So I have a, a more broader question to everybody in, since in the spirit of this session, which is on uh, new technology and commercialization, I, I think there's a challenge here and that is uh, we know, you know, unlike trickle-down economy, which doesn't work in my mind, trickle-down technology works actually pretty well. So we have all these expensive technologies like you know, Tesla and iPhones that they start targeting the most wealthy segment, and then they become cheaper and cheaper over time. That's one model of bringing new technologies to society, but it seems that in medicine this hasn't happened or it's very hard to achieve, especially, for example, personalized medicine it's going to stay expensive forever because a custom-made car is always expensive. So, so there's an oxymoron now with global access of that. And if cancer care has to be personalized, how do we make it accessible to everybody? It's inherently expensive. So there are two ways to look at the cost. One is the, the cost per patient, but the second actually goes back to you know, what is the clinical response rate? So today, 70% of the drug spend is ineffective. Uh, mm -hmm. And so we need to change the entire model uh, because drugs are, are pretty much the only thing on the planet that you don't get to return if they don't work, right? So whether or not the patient benefits from it, you're still paying for it, and, and that's a big problem. So, you know, one of the ways that we can begin to, to curb cost at the societal level is to make sure that we're only delivering the care that actually benefits the patient. Uh, and we have to move to a model like that. Uh, there's no way that we can sustain the current paradigm. Um, so... You know, the other thing to think about, too, is, 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 you know, from the beginning, when the technology is being developed, how you're going to use it. So, like, just biotherapeutics, we always thought about we wanted to get to lower cost. And as we, you know, but if you're just lowering the cost of the, of the drugs that you're producing, you go out and you sell them at the same cost, it's not going to work. It's kind of... In, in part, what, what, what you know, you're talking about is, is looking at a, at a, at a different model. Um, so you really got to um, think about, you know, how do you do the clinical trials cheaper? How do you develop the technology? But then how do you um, change the whole mindset and, and find other people that also want to reduce the cost and get it out there for a lower cost? And we've actually been finding that, um, you know, because there's the personalized medicine, but you know, the very, the broader medicines, like the monoclonal antibodies where you use them, you know, say infectious disease, that's across a, a, a you know, broad population. And those are always gonna be there. So then it's, it's really finding the different groups to come together to say, yes, we can sell it for, you know, low cost that, that gets it out there that the, the 
you know, low-income countries can use, but then even translating that over to how do you do that in the U.S. and still make, because you have to make money on it, but do that and, and get out to a broader population. So I think it's really a mindset. And what we've been finding is, is, is that there are, it's kind of like pockets of people that want to do this that haven't quite come together yet that are starting to. And so maybe drawing that will, will help. You know, that's going to push the cost of the drugs down overall and get them out there for that. I mean, you can't, I totally agree with what you're saying. You, you can't address these downstream issues at the time of registration. You have to start thinking early because there are technology-driven solutions to these problems if you start thinking early enough in development. Um, you know, to, to where you started this conversation, I, um, in the early 2000s, I lived for a little while in East Africa, and I moved there from Manhattan, um, and I got a cell phone when I got to Uganda, and it works so much better than it worked in Manhattan, my cell service. It was much cheaper. Um, people didn't have electricity everywhere, even. But cell service, everyone had cell service. And um, you know, there are no tall buildings to get in the way in Manhattan. That's a huge challenge to get those radio waves through the, through the canyons of the streets. Um, you, know, you basically can leapfrog decades of you know, failing infrastructure with new technologies. Now, technology is not the solution to every problem. But I think that we're seeing, I mean, there are analogous situations in, in, in in drug development. So, you know, for example, with all the single cell based technologies that we have that have been perfected in the oncology setting, you start looking at granulomas in TB patients, you get the right experiment, and with, you know, 30 to 50 patients worth of data, you can make insights that leapfrog decades of, um, you know, research in, in the TB field just because you're getting those tools that have matured elsewhere into the right context with the right experiment. Um, we were, I was at a meeting at the Broad the other day talking about. Uh, a spin-off that they have called Sherlock, and Sherlock uses um, Cas13 uh, based, it's a, the Cas13 based diagnostic company. You know, the Cas13 is an enzyme that cleaves to target RNAs, but when it's activated by a target RNA, it cleaves lots of other RNAs around it, so that that can be used to essentially surround it with um, RNA-based probes that can massively amplify the initial activation signal. What this means is that you can detect single gene variants, one copy in an ML of blood, and they now can basically do this so that you can take in a, a mill of blood um, and um, you know, process it with, you know, basically heat it for, for 20 minutes under a tree somewhere, put a, put a strip in and do a lateral flow assay and, and, and detect a multi, do this in a, in a multiplex assay format under a tree somewhere. So, you know, it's incredible to go from, you know, CRISPR, which is bleeding edge, to you know, sitting under a tree and being able to have new molecular diagnostics for everything from TB to detecting early um, risk for preterm delivery because there are circulating fetal RNAs that you can detect in the circulation. So the applications for some of these cutting edge technologies, we just need people to be thinking about the applications in low cost settings early, and then we can get them in there. But what about Precision medicine or things were, which are really inherently personalized, like in, in Caris, what you have talked about, where you really need very sophisticated personal profiling because every patient is different, like we say here at ISP. So, is there room for making it cheaper when it's really patient tailored? Yeah, I mean, if you look at the cost of the first human genome, it was billion dollars, uh, and now you can do it for a few hundred dollars. The interpretation is the hard part. That's the expensive part, but software will uh, be able to handle that once we have a large enough data set. So, I mean, the, the cost of sequencing is just plummeting faster than Moore's Law, uh, and the bigger the underlying data set that we have, the more insight we'll gain, and uh, I mean, the, one of the, the greatest you know, economic benefits is avoidance of, uh, you know, of adverse events that lead to hospitalization. So when you look at the cost of treating a cancer patient, uh, very rarely it's not, it's the drug that is the primary cost driver. It's the hospitalization events um, that, that really are the primary economic deterrent uh, to being able to, to give more. And that's changing. I mean, we've got some immunotherapies now that you know, would be a million dollars a year, so that's going to change quickly. But, uh, you know, that new wave of technology will have to go through a cost reduction uh, to stay viable. I mean, there's no way that any of those ther therapies will survive uh, at that price point. So it'll have to change. Thank you.
Please. So <clears throat> it, at one time, 97% of all computers in the world were from one company. What was that company? IBM. IBM did not create the whole new world. Little tiny companies of creative people that did the impossible. And they were beat up for years by IBM. But they believed. And I mean, who could have predicted Moore's curve? A 100,000-fold increase in transistors per chip without an increase in the cost of the chip. I mean, my god. So, you know, what will happen depends on who does it and why. And big companies say it costs this much. Little companies say, how do I get to this cost? What do I have to do to do that? Then, <clears throat> you know, and 80%, whatever the number might be, 80% of patients on average across all diseases, all drugs, do not benefit from their treatment. They take the risk with no benefit. Enormous amounts of money are lost. And I'd like all of you to think about that silly signal to noise slide, that what diagnostics can do, a power function of what they can do, to lowering the number of patients, lowering the time, lowering the cost. Now, big pharma, not going to do that, but little companies will because they have to. Yeah. So you can create a new world. You know, pharmacists cost a billion dollars to get the drug to market. That is not true. For a drug that does get to market, it costs a billion. But the average cost is seven to ten billion, the fully loaded cost, real cost, fully loaded cost. Seven to ten billion and doubling every five to seven years. You know, you know it's got to end. And other companies are beginning to grow with great young people. You know? <clears throat> Everything that turned out great started small, including these three <laughs> guys here. <Yeah. laughs> people, people are afraid to start small or do things small. I live at UCLA. It has to be a great big project. That's not how the new world is created. <clears throat> small projects with great people, and they'll change the world. You know, in that group I showed you, uh, University of Heidelberg and Essen and Munich and UCLA, UCSF, ISB and our companies, we're here to help. You know, we, we control what we do, both academically and commercially. And we're driven by purpose, not process. So if there are ways that we can help improve the outcome for patients, we will do it. You know? There are things we, we can't do everything, you know? but we can do some things.